All right. Good afternoon um, or good morning to wherever you may be Zooming in from. I'm Rachel Messerich, Programs Manager, Legacy and Editorial for the American Craft Council and the coordinator behind the American Craft Forums series. I'm so pleased to welcome you all to this American Craft Forums program in association with our quarterly publication, American Craft Magazine. I'm speaking to you today from my home in Apple Valley, Minnesota, and representing the offices of the American Craft Council in Minneapolis, which are both located on the traditional, ancestral, and contemporary lands of the Dakota and Ojibwe people. This place carries a complicated and layered history. In the thousands of years the Dakota and Ojibwe people have been in relationship and kinship with the land here, and in the several hundred years since European settlers colonized the land that the state of Minnesota now occupies. The United States land seizure was a project of destruction that denied the Dakota and Ojibwe free and unhindered access to land that fundamentally shapes their identity and lives. We pay tribute to the Dakota and Ojibwe and invite you to consider the land on which you live and the confluence of legacies that bring you to stand where you are, particularly through critical reflection and conversation with your own community. Fostering conversation and community are at the heart of ACC's mission, and American Craft serves as one of the most vital contributions and service to this mission, and hopefully to the field of craft and American culture. ACC's 80 plus year old publication contributes to the craft conversation by shining a light on the diversity, resilience, beauty, and impact of American Craft and its makers. In 2023, we look at craft through the lens of four themes, inhabit, vessel, wild, and collect. The editorial team is just wrapping up the summer issue, which will be hitting mailboxes in mid-May and has plans well underway for the fall 2023 issue, collect. We encourage pitches and submissions from our community and have more information on the rest of the 2023 themes and soon to have 2024 themes on our website. Please check underwriters guidelines and submissions for more information. Before I dive into the program and my introduction, I also just wanted to thank the ACC staff, particularly our executive director, Andrea Specht, our uber talented editorial team, our amazing marketing team, and our director of finance and administration, Tracy Lamperty, who is taking the behind the scenes tech helm for today's program. The American Craft Council is a national nonprofit member-based organization. As such, I would also like to give a big shout out to our donors and members who make programs like this possible. Um, and a very special thank you to the Minnesota State Arts Board and Wingate Charitable Foundation for their generous support. A few technical and logistical reminders, please make sure that your camera is off and your audio is muted for the program and conversation. We encourage you to participate in the talk via the chat feature and drop any comments or questions there. Closed captioning is available during this program. On the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see a closed caption symbol. Clicking that button will turn this feature on and off. This program will also be recorded and available for future viewing. In the spring issue, we explored the idea of vessel, a seemingly simple yet surprisingly evocative word that carries layers of complexity. Beyond its first definition as a method of containment, vessels are also carriers, not only of objects, but of people, experiences, meaning. There is an ancient quality to this word, this theme, that goes back to the beginning of history, beyond that even. In her essay, A World of Vessels, which also appears in the spring issue, curator and director of the Museum of Art and Wood, Nava Milliken, references artist Jack Larimore's reflections on the vessel as a container for living things. Wherever they are on their journey, the living materials, both contained and containing, that tell a story that reaches the most primeval part within us all. These layered definitions and symbols come together naturally when thinking about watercraft, vessels crafted to carry people from one destination to another, while also carrying a culture, a history, an identity. To help guide us and our speakers through this conversation on how boat building and the history of our watercraft connects communities, I would like to introduce our amazing moderator, Dr. Anton Troyer, who will in turn provide brief introductions for our speakers. Dr. Troyer, I invite you to turn on your camera now. <clears throat> Dr. Troyer is professor of Ojibwe at Bemidji State University and author of many, many books. He has a BA from Princeton University and an MA and PhD from the University of Minnesota. He is editor of the 
Oshka Bewis Native Journal, the only academic journal of the Ojibwe language. Dr. Troyer has presented all over the US and Canada and in several foreign countries on everything you wanted to know about Indians but were afraid to ask, cultural competency, racial equity, strategies for addressing the achievement gap, and tribal sovereignty, history, language, and culture. He has sat on many organizational boards and has received more than 40 prestigious awards and fellowships, including one from the American Philosophical Society, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the National Science Foundation, the MacArthur Foundation, the Bush Foundation, and the John Simon Guggenheim Foundation. His published works are many and varied and include everything you wanted to know about Indians but were afraid to ask, the Language Warriors Manifesto, how to keep our languages alive no matter the odds, the cultural toolbox, traditional Ojibwe living in the modern world, a warrior nation, a history of the Red Lake Ojibwe, and among many others. Dr. Troyer is a member of the United Nations Technical Working Group on Sustainable Developmental Goals through Inclusive Just Energy Solutions and the Governing Board for the Minnesota State Historical Society. In 2018, he was named Guardian of Culture and Lifeways and recipient of the Pathfinder Award by the Association of Tribal Archives, Libraries, and Museums. Thank you so much. Please join me in welcoming um, Dr. Troyer. Thank you so much for being here, everyone. Um, and I will kick it over to you, Anton, to get us started. Thank you so much for a wonderful introduction and thank you everybody for joining us today. I wanted to give you a brief shout out in my Ojibwe language. Uh, when Rachel asked me to speak on the American Craft Forum. She didn't say anything at all about using a foreign language like English. But I, I didn't really expect everybody to understand me well. But I rely upon people smarter, older, wiser than me who say, when you meet somebody new, use our indigenous protocol, share your native name. So I was adding that my native name is Wagosh, that means fox. I come from the Eagle Clan. In our tribe, we have a clan system where there are animals, birds, and fish that double as a symbol for your family and a spiritual guide of sorts. And I really consider myself fortunate in many, many different ways. Among them, I think a lot of Native academics end up having to move away from home in order to pursue jobs and things like that. And I get to live in my home community we are still in the process of trying to melt snow. So it's piled up outside the window here in Northern Minnesota. And we just started our maple sugar operation. And I really love living here for many reasons. It's not just that the grandparents for all nine of our children have lived within 10 minutes of the front door, but we have been able to you know, live in this modern world and honor our indigenous traditions. And one of the things that amazes me about the native experience, I think for many Americans, native people are often imagined, but infrequently well understood. And sometimes the stories that we hear are maybe a sugar-coated version of Chris Columbus in the first Thanksgiving you know, when it pops up in educational spaces, it's stories from before 1900, and they're all stories with a tragic ending. And I think it's really important to remind people of something that amazes me all the time, which is not everything we've lost, but everything we still have. And our artistic traditions, music, languages, uh, communities, and culture are still going. And we have found the pace of cultural change uh, and all the problems that are more obvious to you in the world, you know, challenging for us too. But in spite of all of that, today I will be able to introduce you to a couple of people who have really mastered the art and culture of creating watercraft 
Uh, I know Jim Jones especially well as he lives in the same area that I do and is, you know, learned from some of the great masters, the Ojibwe art of making birch bark canoes. I did write a piece for the um, American Craft magazine publication about the birch bark canoe, uh, although I myself am not, you know, a master craftsman. And so I'm going to be letting the, the people who've mastered this craft share more about what they do, how they do it, and also the meaning behind their work and, and what drives them with this. And hopefully uh, that will get some good conversation started for all of you. And even though we only have a short amount of time for one presentation, I hope it'll spark some interest in further inquiry um, amongst all of you. It's kind of amazing, you know, humans have changed so much and so quickly throughout history, but especially accelerating in more recent years. But the canoe is an architectural development that has survived through millennia because it is simply that practical. And when you look at early contact times with indigenous people in the Great Lakes, for example, you know, we lived quite differently, but some of the things that united all of us was the water, both then and now, indigenous communities throughout this entire region have been on the water and the lakes and rivers were the highways that connected people through commerce, trade, even in warfare. And, you know, a lot of people assume that the biggest deciding factors in warfare might have been the introduction of firearms by Europeans, but the Ojibwe and some of the, you know, their cousin tribes, Ottawa, Potawatomi, and so forth, had extreme advantages in warfare because they had mastered the birch bark canoe, which was lighter, more buoyant, faster in the water um, than some of the other watercraft that other neighboring tribes had. And the birch bark canoe could be scaled up. Um, so if you were on smaller inland lakes, you could have a 13 foot canoe or a you know, 15, 16 foot canoe. And if you were on the big water, uh, Lake Superior, you could scale that up, you know, much, much longer. And sometimes people would build canoes, you know, 30 feet long, uh, which would make it possible to haul massive amounts of cargo. And even through the contact period, uh, the Ojibwe and many other tribes were able to increase their standard of living uh, before you know, the American empire started, you know, intentionally trying to crush native people and take all of the land away. So it's an amazing story about the canoe. So I will uh, quit talking for a minute and I'm going to bring in our uh, crafts people to talk about how they make watercraft. Uh, and I know Jim Jones, for example, has made canoes ranging from 13 feet to 27 feet long, uh, some of which were taken on kind of epic voyages too. And so, uh, you know, I'm really excited to hear what he has to share also from an indigenous Ojibwe perspective about the traditional Ojibwe birch bark canoe. And then we're also going to be hearing from Daniel who has been working on both ocean going and inland craft that are constructed differently, not just from birch bark, um, but with woodcraft, and also actively teaches this in his profession. So they both have so much to share. I'm going to invite them to turn their cameras on, and we will cue you up to share a little bit about what you do. All right. And uh, yeah, Jim, why don't you go ahead and go first, and then we'll have Daniel go right after. Sounds good. Uh, miigwech, Anton. Thank you very much. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, I'm very honored to be here with some unique people, friends and colleagues. Uh, me and Anton known each other for quite a few years. We go back a long way. Um, 
know his family as well. I worked with um, his brother, David, um, his sister. Um, so it just goes to show <clears throat> that our communities are big, but in actuality, they're really small. I'm honored to be here as a builder. Um, everyone refers to me as a master builder. I'm very humbled by that. Um, I was taught by some great people that drilled into me precision and perfection and accuracy, making sure that the canoes that we built are historically accurate to canoes that were once based and completed. And so having that opportunity to do that um, gave me the opportunity to pass on that canoe building. And the pictures that you're all seeing are from the Leech Lake Tribal College canoe that we built back in the year, I forgot. <laughs> and it was a 17, 16 foot Birch Park old style, Algonquin style canoe we built. And when we were getting ready and gathering the bark, my late son, William, um, said, hey, dad, let's dye this roots red for the gun rail lacing. And I said, <laughs> right on, let's do it. So we went and got some dye, not traditional dye, we went and got some commercial dye and we soaked the roots. And after we had split them, and then that's what you see, the gunwale lacing for that canoe. Those spruce roots are still nice and brightly red to this day. Um, we covered it with a gunwale cap to protect the lacing as you're paddling the canoe. And that's one thing that you know, the form and function of these, these watercraft. I started in 2001 building canoes. Um, the first canoe we built was a 27 foot fur trade canoe for four Frenchmen who took that from the Northwest coast <clears throat> all the way up to Hudson Bay, Canada in 2000, 2001. That winter we built a seven, uh, 13 footer and a 15 footer that was used in a French film uh, that was filmed up in the Yukon. The Leech Lake tribal community paid for shipping all three of those canoes to the Northwest Coast back in 2001 in the spring. And then they got credited for their contribution for doing that. But we pointed out to Leech Lake and to the tribal council that everything that went into these canoes came from home the bark, the trees, the, the wood that was used, the cedar, all of that came from the Chippewa National Forest. It came from home. And so they sponsored paying for, and the only way we could ship that big canoe all together was on a semi truck. And so we had a logger come in, use the flatbed, covered up the canoes and he shipped them across country and the four Frenchmen who were receiving the canoe were so excited, not only by their canoe coming in on this big truck, but they were so excited to see a big truck like that to begin with as well, because keeping in mind, they came from France, they didn't have big semis like that. I didn't know that until, you know, later on. But for me, when we got done with that canoe, the all that you just sit back and looked at that thing that a little bit of all of us went into it. And that's how I feel about each craft that I produce. Each canoe, part of me goes into it. Part of my community goes into it. Part of my son now is part of that. So seeing the Leech Lake Tribal College canoe get used every year for me, it keeps my mind and my son's memory alive and mine, but also it's a living thing. Everything in that canoe that goes into it, there's no metal, there's no screws, 
There's no nails that are put into a canoe. The only thing you see modern on these canoes that people are not aware of is we use a black polyurethane pitch. Why? Because it's less maintenance. You don't have to keep melting spruce pitch and balsam pitch and mixing it with charcoal and animal fat to create that resin and to reapply it every year. That's the only thing modern on our canoes is that we use that black polyurethane caulking to seal the canoe with. But there is no nail, no screws or nothing. Everything in the canoe, the cedar for the thorts, for the gunwales, are not for the thorts, but for the uh, planking, the ribs, and the gunwales, and even the stem piece, the headboard, are all made out of cedar. <clears throat> the thorts are usually made out of birch or maple or ash because it has to be a hardwood. The lacing is spruce uh, roots, or you can use jack pine roots, and they're double split. We learned that one by looking at an old canoe that was built in the early 1930s that came from the northwest, northeast coast and was brought over here and shipped over here. And it was in a house in Cass Lake in a garage. It was in a cabin. And the man and wife said, hey, look, we got this other thing with it. And it turned out it was a repair kit. And when Grant looked at the lacing of that, that they had shipped along with it, along with the three pound little block, a pitch that was already prepped and prepared, all it had to be was melted and heated. And then there was another container and it was like 56 inches high and it was a square box. Inside of that box was a complete roll of bark, one piece of bark. That bark, if you rolled it out, would have been 17, 16 feet long. It was 56 inches wide. <clears throat> you wrap that around and figure out the circumference of that tree it came from. We would be only so fortunate to come across a tree like that today. With clean bark, no limbs, no disparities on it. They're still out there, but finding a canoe, a tree that's good enough for canoe bark is very rare today. It's very rare to come across a tree that is good enough to be used for birch bark for a canoe. There are a lot of trees that I have passed up in my past that I left for craft people to do smaller craft work for baskets, or other types of ornamental work, you know. Then on the other hand, there's trees that we went back to and we checked three, four years ago and went back and checked them again and the bark was thicker. That tree could be harvested now for canoe bark. So it's unique. It's a learning thing. You're out in the summertime feeding mosquitoes and deer flies and you're fighting the bugs to get, to get to the bark. You're packing a ladder with you. My son at the time figured out how to shimmy up a tree using a ratchet strap and a part of a ladder. I don't know how he did it, but him and his buddy were able to ratchet this ladder up on the tree, climb up it, use the utility blade and cut the bark and pop eight nine foot sections at a time. Back in the day, historically, we would see them old timers take an ax, chop the whole tree down so they could get that whole tree length, you know? In the years I've been building canoes, I've cut down three, maybe four trees. The canoe I did up in Seguin First Nation up in Canada, when that elder took me out to state parkland or to uh, regional parkland, they cut those trees down for that bark. 
And then I'm like, well, what are you going to do with the tree? And he, he elder looked at me and he laughed and he said, well, don't you worry about that. He said, that's going to be my firewood come this fall. He said, I already have that tree sold. He said, and I started laughing and he said, no, seriously, I'll come back and I'll, I'll cut the wood up and use it for firewood. So I'm saying, oh, okay. So I said, boy, if we did that on the Chippewa National Forest, they'd be still looking for me. So, shh. <laughs> canoes were an important part of the history of our people the history of our nation and building upon the waterways the fur trade was only successful because we had these trade networks going back millenniums my background is in archaeology cultural resource work so i see the archaeology and i see the inner commerce what nations had amongst each other. I'm currently in North Dakota working and I've been looking at Knife River Flint like you would not believe. That's a lithic resource that's utilized for tool making, flint napping. The oldest types of projectile points found in North America were made with Knife River Flint. There's only one place that Knife River Flint comes from, and it's in Dunn County, North Dakota. But yet we see that throughout Turtle Island in multiple sites, multiple places, utilized over time period and time period, the paleo, archaic, late woodland, early woodland, every unique tribal group and time period in what we call this timeline of history utilize this resource but how did it get from dunn county north dakota to northern minnesota how did it get up into canada western states southern states that trade network we had amongst each other is how it got there we bartered and traded with one another so when the europeans started coming over after our beaver pelts and trading with indigenous nations. They looked at our watercraft and try to follow us with their own craft. And they're like, we're getting left behind. They couldn't hang with us. They couldn't follow us. So they adopted our watercraft. They used our canoes. They used our trade networks to start and barter this trading system. That's what the success of the trade network and the fur trade helped North America and development. But it was already there amongst our own people, especially the Ojibwe, the Algonquin people, the people of Turtle Island and the Great Lakes nations. We utilize those watercrafts. And so when I look at the archeology span and the histories that we have amongst our people, I identify what we call a cultural corridor now. How do we get from the Great Lakes region over to White Earth, to Fond du Lac, Mille Lacs, to Leech Lake, even to Red Lake? It's by water, which is utilizing our canoes. As Anton said, during warfare, you could tell by the front of that canoe coming across that lake on Leech Lake. And if you were camped on Bear Island, you could see coming across from the mouth of Boy River, whether or not that canoe party coming out of the river was friend or foe. You could tell if it was a Dakota war party coming after you. And those Ojibwe would flee from Bear Island to Sugar Point or even over to Otter Tail Point to the main village to warn them the Dakota are coming. When Joseph Nicolette, the French explorer, first came up and brought schoolcraft up to find the source of the Mississippi, it was two Ojibwe guides who guided him. They took him from Crow Wing up to Leech Lake to Flatmouth Village on Otter Tail. They took them by boat. 
they took them up this cultural corridor from Crow Wing up through Roosevelt Lake, outing Minnesota, Thunder Lake, Boy River into Leech Lake. And when Nicolette asked Bruni on Chagabe, how do you know this route? They told him this was the Dakota war route that the Dakota would use to attack our villages on Leech Lake. The connections, the history. And by the front of that canoe, you could tell by the shape and the front. And before you could even see a tribal logo or a clan encrypted on the front of that canoe by utilizing winter bark, you could tell by the shape whether or not those were friends or Ojibwe or were there enemies that were coming at you. You know, so the watercraft had an important part in our history and in the development of our nations, you know. And it's part of our history and our culture. So for me to be able to continue that craft work and learn and pass that on to my children, to my community members and others is a very honor for me. When I get done with a canoe, I sit there for a half an hour, <clears throat> sometimes up to an hour, just staring at it. Because I'm in such, such deep awe of what we had just done. And then I tell everyone when one leaves, make sure you do the right thing with it. And they look at me puzzled, like, what do you mean? What I mean by that is I say, make sure you feed it. Make sure you feed her or him. And they look at me and I said, not only feast it, but make sure you put them in the water every year. They're made to be in the water. You have to reabsorb that bark, that wood. It has to breathe and has to be fed. Always make sure you feed them. And when you look at these boats that have been discovered going back millenniums old boats <clears throat> where have they been found they've been found in the water sunk because that's how we're connected Jimmy Gwich. me Gwich, jim amazing stories yeah we always uh laugh like half of the lakes and rivers around here were some non-native explorer trying to name it after himself thinking it was the headwaters of the Mississippi and they finally gave up and asked one of the natives and they brought him right to it. I'm going to bring up uh, Daniel next to share some of his knowledge and wisdom about his craft. Uh, he has an amazing story to share and after that we will get into a discussion. Thank you. Thank you Anton. Uh, if you were to follow the waters that's now known as the St. Lawrence and continue all the way up. Um, that's where I'm at now, at the end of where the Penobscot nations are now. And those same waterways connect and make their way down to the Great Lakes. So those cultural corridors, the area that I'm in um, is so influenced uh, by that. And uh, there have been in so many places um, along the eastern seaboard here where I've been working and seeing uh, a lot of these watercraft and the developments as those canoes, as the Europeans have like come and started to take that influence and work with that. So um, the place that I'm at specifically, uh, I work at this uh, really wonderful organization called the Apprentice Shop. Uh, it's located in Rockland, Maine. Um, which is Penobscot territory. Um, and uh, I feel super fortunate to be here. Um, if you would go to the next slide for me. Um, there's a really beautiful waterfront here. Um, we're right on uh, Rockland Harbor, right on the ocean. Um, and the apprentice shop, I guess, to give you a little bit more context here is uh, it's a two year apprenticeship program for boat building and seamanship, um, where we build traditional wooden boats, uh, rowing and sailing, uh, and motor boats, some as well. Um, but all wooden boats, which is a really wonderful thing to be able to do. Um, 
I'm very much in love with that woodcraft. I didn't start here. Um, I was much more of an inland creature to begin my life. Um, so I spent a lot more time on rivers and lakes uh, and canoeing. And um, before coming to the apprentice shop, um, but uh, this place drew me in. Um, I started after spending a lot of time inland uh, teaching outdoor education programs and experiential education programs um, with youth. I started thinking a lot about how I could have a better impact. Um, and if there was like a better venue for me to be able to like teach through. Um, and I started reading some philosophy, some educational philosophy. And um, what that led me to was uh, the thought of using vessels as a venue to teach. Um, and so if you look in the bottom left-hand corner of this picture that's up now, you see this kind of like semi-transparent um, sort of a greenhouse shaped structure. This is the um, kind of campus of the apprentice shop. And, but in that, in that structure, if you would go to the next slide, um, this is where I work specifically. And I've been super lucky to be able to start working with youth um, at the apprentice shop. Um, this is a group of students who have come from the local high school. Um, and the boat that we've been working on and building, and this is mostly being built by them, is a 40 foot Portuguese sardine carrier called the Cano de Bacada, um, and which is literally a Portuguese translation that means canoe of sardines. Um, and uh, so I got really lucky in that uh, I've, I've been able to work with these students and be doing the thing that I love and, uh, and be using the watercraft as a venue to teach. Um, and I kind of, I got pulled into that um, with a really strong desire to kind of start to combine some of the like inland work that I was doing where I was teaching ecology and um, like uh, some forestry practices and all these different things that are related to much more land-based things. Um, and, and now I'm able to kind of tie those two things together through the woodworking and through the teaching, um, you know, forestry and forest ecology, but also, um, you know, being able to explore the tide line and uh, be with people and go and sail and use um, smaller vessels and um, spend time along the coast here uh, in this beautiful area because we have a tons of different islands along the coast of Maine that are really fantastic to explore and spend time in. Um, if you would go to the next slide for me. Um, we have uh, part of this building process, I think is really wonderful, um, where we get to spend a lot of time uh, working with like much larger timber. And because of that, like, also the trees that we've been working with. Um, so in this picture, you can see some of the youth are actually cutting out frames for this boat that we're putting together. Um, these were taken a little bit ago. Um, so these traditional boats that are more European in design are pretty uh, similar in a lot of ways, but also really distinctly different from um, birch bark canoes. Um, and some of the craft that are native to this place. Um, these boats are really heavy in their use of timber. Um, you know, the hulls are made out of wood. The boat is framed in wood. Um, because of that, they're much heavier a lot of the times. And that lightness is not as easily achieved um, as you can with birch bark. Um, as Jim was saying, it, I find it fascinating because in reading some of the literature that uh, I've, I've been paying attention to, you know, there's accounts of the whaling vessels arriving along the eastern seaboard here, and the people in birch bark canoes, they weren't, they weren't just inland craft. Um, they were used uh, in between, like, 
Maine and Nova Scotia and folks would paddle across the Bay of Fundy and they were used to get back and forth between the islands and they were used to transport food. Um, and so they weren't just inland craft. And when folks showed up on whaling ships and the colonialists were showing up, those birch bark canoes, they paddle circles around them. And so um, the boats that I work with a lot of the times have taken a lot of influence from the canoes. Um, and those canoes informed a lot of the vessels that I'm working with, but they're still still not quite quite as good or as beautiful. Um, but as Jim was saying, it's hard to get the bark, you know? So if you would go to the next frame, um, this, uh, to give you a little bit more context about the apprentice shop, um, this is the first type of boat that I ever built. This is called a Susan Skiff. Um, when apprentices come here uh, to start their, their learning process, um, they spend the first six months building one of these boats. And this kind of gives everybody uh, a really good primer on woodworking. Um, and one of the things that I think is really distinctive about uh, the boats that we're working on versus birch bark canoes and something that kind of is a difference between those two um, is that these vessels, like I said, are, are heavier and uh, there's some durability that comes with that, but also the style of construction. Um, I have a huge amount of respect for Jim because if you can tell from the photos he was showing, those canoes, they get put together and they're built by eye. And, um, and there's not a lot of, you didn't see a lot of tape measures in those pictures or a lot of drawings. And these boats that I build and work on, uh, folks are trying to be able to build the same boat over and over again, or um, kind of design and then refine the design of a vessel. So these boats are built in a different way because of that. Um, if you would go to the next slide, um, this is a representation of uh, a half hull model. So it's like a really small wood carving of a vessel. Um, and these half hull models are what builders would use um, to, to carve a small like prototype, so to speak, of a design. And you can see even both of these vessels, there's some characteristics that are fairly similar to canoes. You know, they both have these like really beautiful double-ended hull shapes. Um, the area where they're like the most wide is different locations, but um, you know, even these two half hull models will kind of speak to some of the influence of canoes. And but once you have a little prototype like this, um, you could take this and then take the shape off of this and scale it up. And if you would go to the next slide, um, when you scale that up and you take that little carving and you draw that full size, um, this is what we would call a lofting. Um, and the lofting is now a really big two-dimensional drawing of what you've created in that little tiny model. Um, and with that lofting, you can take uh, all your molds off and you can create a whole bunch of patterns. And with those patterns and those molds, you can start to create the shape of a boat. Um, and once you create that shape, you can start wrapping planking around that. Um, and if you go to the next slide for me, you can see here, this is, uh, some, some of the molds for a vessel that I built a while back. Um, and this is like, if you think of it like the backbone of a vessel, like the spine, and you can see these frames or the ribs and then around it, you wrap the, the planking, which is the skin of the boat. Um, so these are some ways in which like the boats that I'm working on are kind of differentiated um, from these canoes. Um, but in so many other ways, their evolution uh, was like very heavily influenced by these canoes. And if you go to the next slide, 
Um, this boat, for example, is one that I built shortly after um, building a Susan's Skiff. This is a Leonard design whale boat. Um, and there was a lot of whaling that was done on the coast here um, before colonialists showed up that was done with canoes um, and a lot of fishing that was done off the coast here. And um, that influence carries over. So this boat, you can see so much of that canoe shape in this vessel. Um, they actually would sail this boat and then the mast could be pulled down and they would also row it. But when they were whaling out of it, they would paddle it because the paddles are the most quiet. Um, and that was how they would get as close to the whales as they could for the harpooners. Um, this was a really fantastic learning curve and kind of helped start tying some of the traditional boats that the shop builds in my mind to the boats that I was familiar with when I first got here, which was the canoes. Um, this was also really fun because after we finished building it, uh, myself and this group of people that are on board, uh, we wound up taking this boat from Rockland, Maine down to Mystic, Connecticut, and we sailed it down there as a delivery. So to take a sailing vessel and rowing vessel and spend a few hundred miles across the coast, um, bringing this boat down to Mystic, Connecticut was, uh, was quite an experience. It was super influential uh, for me. Um, but it was also, it put a lot of things into context, um, you know, like spending time on an open boat along the coast uh, is quite a learning curve. Um, and uh, the last couple of slides that I have for you are just two other smaller craft that I think are some wonderful other examples of vessels that are very similar um, and also developments of, of fishing boats that are still used off the coast. Um, we're actually building a boat like this right now uh, downstairs. It's called a pea pod. Um, there were tons of variants of this type of boat that were built. Um, if you go to the next photo, you see another picture of one with a different sailing rig and slightly different lines. But you can see so much of the canoe in this. Um, and so to me, these boats are, are a pretty good example of, of the way that um, I think the canoes and the indigenous cultures here had like reached an apex with this watercraft. Um, and, and then that design just got played with and utilized in different ways, it got changed in different ways to allow for its use um, along the coast here. But uh, it's a, a vessel that carries through in so many ways. And, has carried so many people and so much goods and connected so many people as well. Um, so that's what I have to say about that. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and knowledge of the craft. It's, it's really quite amazing. So Daniel, if you wouldn't mind, keep your video on and I'll bring Jim back and we will take uh, a couple minutes for some conversation and field questions. Everybody who's tuning in, feel free to drop questions into the chat. I can't guarantee we'll get to all of them, but we will do our best to field as many as, as we can. But I've got a couple to get us started. And I see Thomas asked one about paddles and there was a little response from Jim there. But for starters, just, you know, you can give us just a little bit more than a tweet, but not a full blog about you know, how do you do your craft? Like we could see in the, in the images that you both shared that there were teams of people. So is this the kind of thing where, you know, you want to teach what you know to young people or that you really need a team to build a boat like this? So give us a little better sense for each of you about how you go about building it. How long does it take to build one? And then I could also notice some differences in the types of crafts you have, you know, for Daniel, where you're cutting and building the frame, and then the, you know, the skin goes on the outside. And then for Jim with the birch bark canoe, you start with the bark, and then the frame gets built inside, you know, of the bark that you've already built. So give us a little, a little more on how you do what you do. I'll let you go first, Jim, and then we'll go to you, Daniel. And uh, <coughs> 
people understand that. Real quick, the first thing is finding the tree, finding the birch for the canoe. Deciding what canoe are you going to build? How wide is it going to be? What is the length? And so talking with the client or somebody, what is it that you're looking for the length? What style do you want? Oh, because that's going to affect it. What? We are full up right now and there's a waiting list, but I always. Um, oh, Ashley, could you mute? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know what happened. I just lost it. So bark canoe uh, style gathering the bark first is the first step. I can always go find the cedar and the wood because I know there's a resource and a location for that. Um, but the first thing is finding the bark for a canoe, making sure it's thick enough and it's the right bark. And yeah, once you gather it, the time period it takes, the Lakeland video canoe that I posted about, that we did that in a week, nonstop, 10, 12 hour days. One night, Kevin and Myra were working under lights until about 10, 30, 11 stitching the canoe because we we're trying to get it done in a week for Lakeland Television. The fur trade canoe we did, the 27 footer way back in the day, took about three weeks, I think total from start to finish. You know, the canoes we did in March in the winter time took two weeks, you know, and I was doing two canoes at the same time. Four people, five of us working on it, you know. So it's it's all varies, you know, it depends on the material, how quickly you gather and get everything together. We do utilize the people to go out and help dig spruce roots because you need a lot of spruce roots for a canoe like that. You have to have around 3,000 uh, feet of roots for a canoe. And so you need to gather that spruce roots, split it and get it ready. And so having people go out into a cedar swamp or spruce swamp with you to dig is always a welcome thing, you know, share the love of the mosquitoes. Actually, it ain't bad in the, in the swamp when you're digging spruce roots, it's more brutal when you're digging or when you're out gathering the bark and the mosquitoes and flies are tearing you up. That's it for me. All right, thanks. Go ahead, Daniel. Um, the, I guess the, the first process and the timeline, um, the timeline can vary so much depending upon the craft. Um, you know, in, in wooden watercraft, there's there's such variety in size, um, which I think also predicates the quantity of people. Um, to me and where I'm working, so much of it is focused on the educational side of things. Um, so as many people as you can get involved in a process for the sake of the learning and sharing the information and knowledge, the better. Um, personally, uh, I work best by myself, which is ironic and a little bit of a hypocrisy in a way, I guess. Um, so there are some processes that I really enjoy just doing by myself, but um, you know, the main focus is working with people. So as many as possible. Uh, for the, like those pea pods that I was um, showing a couple pictures of, a vessel like that, by a skilled builder could be put together over the course of three or four months um, pretty easily. Um, they aren't super labor intensive. The pieces aren't that big. You don't need big timber um, to put them together. Um, does that answer your questions well? Or? Yeah, that's good. I, I can see there are a lot of questions coming up in the chat and some of them are about you know, technique materials and kind of, you know, the how part of crafts. And there's another group of questions, which is about, you know, how are skills being passed on to other people? Um, is this knowledge expanding or is it endangered and decreasing? And then some other ones related to that. How can I learn more? Where would I get more information? How can I be involved? And so I'll put that, you know, those to both of you. 
Um, since you have, you're in different parts of the country and you have somewhat different types of craft, um, do you think that the, I'll, I'll catch you first, Jim, is knowledge of birch bark canoe building growing or is it a really endangered skill and shrinking and what's being done to you know, share this knowledge with new generations of canoe builders? It's the indigenous knowledge is um, slowly gaining momentum again, you know, but for a number of years, it really died off to just a select group of people who were still doing a canoe here and there, you know, a number of years ago, 10 years ago, boom, there was like a big rush of canoe builders that were doing work, you know, I remember Fond du Lac commissioned two different canoes that summer. Um, I was checking them out at the Fond du Lac uh, Museum and I was kind of looking at that one and I'm like, is that a screw in there? And the elder kind of looked up at me and kind of rolled his eyes and there, there might be a screw or something in there or two, he said, you know, and I kind of chuckled and he's like, why don't you? I'm like, no, <laughs> we don't. But I've seen people in our community um a lady i work with um oh, her dad and her husband took the initiative and built the canoe themselves and uh Ange angela she used to work for the council uh her husband and her dad built the canoe last year on their own without any input uh, there was a young man from Bemidji, Minnesota. Um, his mom and dad used to have a jewelry store, Maxwell. He built his own canoe, uh, did it on his own. I went over and helped him with some of the stitching and lacing and then advised him on uh, on the different parts, you know. So you're seeing a resurgence of people that are starting to do this and you're starting to see other community members from other tribal nations, especially in Ojibwe communities. <laughs> starting to reinvent this crap and starting to do this work. And the best way to learn how to do it is, to, you know, just get involved and people um, have still come up to me and recognize me out in the public. And they'll ask me, well, how do you get past this? You know, I can't find any decent birch trees or I can't find any different uh, ash. And I, I laugh and I chuckle and I said, yeah, because you can't have any knots in it when you're splitting it. You could split it with a knot in it, but you just have to position it. And in the way you split the tree and quarter it is a big part of that, you know. Tricks to the trade that people look at and, you know, people are always coming up to me and asking me technical questions. And, and then they're like, oh, my God, that explains it, you know, like why it, kept splitting out on you, huh? When you're bending it, huh? And they're, because they didn't have the wood split right. Or they went and used wood that was purchased from a lumber yard. And so when they went to bend and steam the, the ribs, they're wondering why they're splitting and breaking on them, you know? Just things you learn and techniques you learn, you know? Thank you. How about in your universe, Daniel? Uh, I think we're kind of poised in a really interesting place right now. What I see happening is um, a lot of like younger folks and folks of my generation who are like kind of filling now the spaces that are left by some of the older folks um, and there's been a pretty good quantity of knowledge passed down. So I think things are getting kind of more expansive um, for this craft. Um, I see a continuum of people who have an interest in learning to work with their hands and learning to uh, learning a trade. Um, and, uh, and that's a really wonderful thing to me. Um, and then I also see people that are like really, really impassioned and kind of like what Jim's alluding to, you know, where there's those tricks and those things that you can learn from the, just a period of time of like doing the thing. 
and learning from the older and the wiser. Um, I feel super fortunate in that uh, I've also gotten to spend a lot of time with some really talented builders and pick up a lot of information from them. Um, and now I can turn around and start sharing that with other people. Um, so I see it as continuing to expand, which is a wonderful thing. Yeah, it, it evokes in me a lot of thinking about, you know, the importance of this kind of work. I think there's a tendency amongst a lot of people in our modern world to think if this doesn't have immediate, tangible economic value, it doesn't have value um, that, um, you know, these are ancient skills, who cares, you know, it's a modern world, and they're dismissive of these things. So I, I doubt that that's the disposition of anybody who's on the call today. Uh, but it might be helpful to have you, again, just give a brief response about the why for your work. Why, why do you do this? Why is it important to teach this to young people? What is the value of your craft? And I guess since you got your video on, Daniel, feel free to grab this one first and we'll come to you with the same question, Jim. That's a, that's a good question. Um, I think there's different levels to the why. Uh, the deepest level for me um, is I think that without uh, an emotional connection and an understanding of the landscape that we live in then people aren't going to care for it and uh, and I see that manifest in like the forests that we have and then the waters that we can go sailing or go paddling on um, so to me that's like the deepest level of why that matters um, the how of that can become more malleable and flexible uh, provided that it's kind of meeting that intention that goal um, this is a way that uh, I've found where I can bring a skill set that I have a lot of strengths in um, and and share that with other people um, and be able to like connect people with the water and connect people with the islands and and then also like the forests are so important, you know um, and to the same thing that Jim's talking about with the birch bark, you know this this landscape in Maine was 80% deforested as of the like mid 1800s. And prior to that, it was like, there was a lot of old growth forest, really rich, healthy landscape. Um, and it's coming back from that and people are caring for it more, which is a really wonderful thing. But, uh, you know, we gotta, the trees have to keep growing uh, to be able to continue to build wooden boats. Um, and uh, and without people caring about that forest, then the boats are going to go by the sideline as well. Um, so I see it as all being connected in that way. Does that answer that question well? Yeah, that's great. How about for you, Jim? What's what's the why? Why does this matter? The continuation of um, a traditional cultural practice, a TCP as it's referred to. An important part of the continuation and the culture of our Anishinaabe people to pass that on to others, you know. But when you take that time off, you know, you got to be able to do that, you know. And so there's this economic thing that gets thrown at us and we have to deal with, you know. I want to be able to retire and go and live back in the woods and hunt, fish, and gather, build canoes, make pottery. You know, but is it going to pay the bills? Is it going to put food on the table? Is it going to keep the style of living or keep us at, you know, keep the lights on, you know? Is it um, going to keep my grandson um, in order, you know? And so the biggest thing right now is preserving what we have out there. And like Daniel's talking about the trees, on the um protecting them as a member of the natural resource advisory committee for our tribe for our community and for my district i represent we just had a hard meeting here a couple of weeks ago talking about birch pole harvesters 
on the reservation. <clears throat> Setting limits to uh, what time of year they can harvest birch poles for decade of use. People are going out and cutting hundreds, hundreds, if not thousands of these birch poles and they're selling them to places like greenhouse companies, ornamental places, big name companies that come in or you go to a flower shop and you order flowers. You know, you're even seeing them in, at uh, Home Depot and Menards and other greenhouses where they're using decorative birch poles for ornamental decorative work. Well, guess where they're coming from? They're coming from our forests. They're cutting future birch trees down that are never going to grow to be a birch bark canoe. For that tree to get to that point, and then they'll argue with us and say, well, when I cut that tree down, five other shoots come up. Oh, yeah. And then guess what happens five, six years from now? You'll be back out there cutting every one of those shoots out because you're gonna harvest those poles next. If we don't start protecting the resources within our tribal communities and our First Nations, we're gonna lose them. Just like the wild rice. I was such an honor to be on the wild rice committee, but you know, it was a big target on my back, you know, and, but we have to make decisions that are not just for me personally or for Anton, but for our grandchildren and our children, for our seven generations moving forward. So that as that lady posted on the chat box, it'd be a shame not to be able to see a canoe floating across the water or lake anymore. Right. Yeah, it's interesting in, in the Ojibwe language, we have a word on a and we use that word for my great grandparent and also for my great grandchild. And the word means my line. It spans seven generations. This is what Jim was just talking about. And so we believe that seven generations ago, our people were probably having a hard time dealing with treaty period and you know all kinds of pressure on us. And they decided that we need to make decisions now to look out for our line seven generations ahead, what will they need? And they determined that we would need land on the water and sovereignty and our language and our culture. And they sacrificed a great many things so we could have that. So today we should be thinking seven generations from now, no one's gonna remember our names, no matter how many canoes we build or how many books we write or whatever we do, but if there's a chance that they can have land with clean water, you know, if they can know who they are, you know, whatever their background or backgrounds happen to be, that that'll be a tremendous gift to them. If we thought in terms of seven generations, we wouldn't even have half the climate change issues that we have right now. So often we sacrifice the well being of people seven generations from now for the quarterly shareholder statement right now. And so I think this, you know, this art form, this craft is very much connected to these big issues about, you know, climate change and economies of scale and things like that. And there's something else, you know, like in our creation story, there's kind of an order to things where, you know, the earth is made and water is placed there and growing things, plants, trees, animals, birds, fish, last of all, humans. And we're often reminded that, you know, if humans disappeared from earth, everything that was made before us would get by just fine, maybe better than ever. But if anything before us were to disappear, surely we would too. There's even this motif in Ojibwe art with the floral designs, which is a kind of humbling reminder that we are dependent on everything in creation. We are not given dominion over the earth. We are part of the web of life, not its masters. And I think it's really important to 
to think about those things as we think about, you know, craft and making things with our hands and, you know, our impacts on Mother Earth and, and things like that. Because there's really quite a bit at stake. And I think something, you know, that, that Jim's also alluding to here is that in tribal communities, there is definitely a resurging interest in our culture, in our life ways and things like that. But we've also been dealing with a lot of big issues like poverty, substance abuse, you know, things like that. And sometimes a tribal government, even when it gets some resources, is thinking about the intervention on the most pressing health concern of the moment. And sometimes these, you know, other dimensions of culture may seem like a luxury uh, for some of them. So one of the things that, you know, I'm, I'm hoping everyone on today's um, call will be able to think about, because a lot of you are involved with nonprofits or you're involved with, you know, various different kinds of craft and art forms and have a passion for these things, is that there are other ways to mobilize resources to advance these things. And to me, the opposite of addiction is not simply sobriety, it's connection. When we connect someone to something healthy, a traditional craft or art form or things like that, it greatly mitigates the pull of these other things. And we kind of become what we do and who we hang out with. So we can become people connected to the earth through these kinds of craft and art and things like that. And there's a great value for all of humankind, not just the individuals who do that. So as you think about your own nonprofits and certainly Minnesota's in a unique situation compared to most states because we have, you know, a percentage of sales tax that goes into a fund to support arts and cultural heritage. And it's been a great support for organizations, some of which are mentioned in the chat, like North House Folk School and others, for doing programming and supporting this kind of work. And, uh, you know, there's a sunset on that. We have to re-up that in the near future. And there are other ways to mobilize resources and support, not just individual artisans and craftspeople, but the organizations that can kind of scale this up and keep these living traditions going and growing in the future. Rachel, I can see that we're uh, getting close on our clock. I don't know if you had any follow-up shopkeeping pieces that you wanted to add before we uh, bid adieu to everybody. No, no, nothing, nothing major. Just, um, just wanting to extend another wonderful, heartfelt thank you to all of our speakers for um, joining us today. Um, your knowledge, your your um, passion um, for the craft, for what you do, um, and how you do it is um, is so appreciated. Um, thank you so much for being here, and thanks to everybody for attending, uh, for taking the time on this Thursday um, to join us. Um, really moving conversation, everybody. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Please keep in touch. Thank you so much. Keep with. Keep with.